right. Well, uh, why don't we get started with the, the main event today, which is a talk about uh, the, the lean startup approach to entrepreneurship is which what we uh, practice here at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, I thank uh, everybody who did pitch uh, for, for doing that and sharing uh, today. It's, it's really important that uh, we get connected. And if you didn't get the opportunity to pitch today, please come to all of our workshops. Uh, we have them at least usually three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And sometimes we have special ones on Monday. Uh, but there's always an opportunity to get plugged into the community and, and build the relationships. So um, today's talk is going to be uh, built off of something that we at Carnegie Mellon developed with Innovation Works. Innovation Works is the Pennsylvania-based seed investor, uh, which also runs the accelerators Alpha Lab, Alpha Lab Gear, and Alpha Lab Health. Uh, it's very, very much aligned with the philosophy of the NSF I Corps, uh, which I would imagine several members of the team, uh, several teams and members of the teams are on uh, the, the call with us today. Uh, so welcome uh, to the 15 new uh, I Corps teams that are working this semester. You can go on to uh, the Swartz Center and Project Olympus websites and actually get to see who those teams are. So there's opportunities to, to, to plug in and work with some of those startups. Um, and so basically, we're going to get through, I think, today, the first two of these agenda items, which is, let's just talk about the philosophy and the approach to building startups and, and what we know has worked through our you know, decades of experience of building startups. Uh, I myself am a five-time uh, entrepreneur, started five different companies. Uh, I've also been involved on the investing side. Uh, I was with a corporate VC PNC, uh, and I am an active personal angel investor, and I also work uh, with a, a team of MBAs and Rob Meyer to, to help manage uh, the 99 Tartans Alumni Investment Group. So, so I, I, I've seen it from both sides here, and, and I can tell you from, from my experience and from, from the industry's experience uh, what works. And then we're going to watch a video from uh, Eric Reese who actually uh, coined the term, the lean startup, uh, and, and uh, you know, give you his take on the process and why it works. You get to, to hear the, my, my, my approach and his approach and how they, they work together. So excited to do that. Um, some people uh, say, you know, hey, you know, th this may be cool for, for Web 2.0, you know, you know, lightweight technology, but this won't work for me, right? Uh, and it's not true. This works for hardware. It works for no tech companies, low tech companies. Uh, it's, it's a tried and true process. And we'll try to hopefully uh, make that uh, understood today. And in fact, many very successful uh, CMU startups have used it. This is a company called Four Moms. Uh, that's Henry Thorne on the right, one of the most famous roboticists and excellent roboticists in the world. They used it to build their uh, apply low cost robotics and electronics to infant care products. Uh, it's been used by Hannah Alexander and Matt Stanton, who won the Invention of the Year Award back in 2014 when they were students here at Carnegie Mellon and developed a company called Soul Power. Uh, it was used by uh, uh, Meredith Grelly, who is a a uh, famous CMU alum who created a really cool experience-driven brand called Wiggle Whiskey. Uh, you guys probably didn't know it, but the Whiskey Rebellion happened right here in Pittsburgh, and, and uh, Meredith has developed a narrative around uh, the really cool products that she has. So uh, and I think that you, you'll be able to see as, you, as we go forward how this, this approach works and, and, and how it can be uh, sort of focused on various types of businesses from the high-tech businesses that Carnegie Mellon is known for uh, to, to the low-tech, no-tech businesses that are out there. And I always like to start things off with a bit of a riddle. And so uh, here's uh, our riddle. The, the, the world record is seven seconds uh, in solving this riddle by smart people from Carnegie Mellon. So uh, I am going to, you know, it's easier to do this in person, but uh, you, you'll turn off your mute and just blurt it out. I'm gonna do the basketball referee count here so you can see me uh, uh, out there doing that. Uh, and I'm gonna start the clock right now, okay? Anybody? What? Three more seconds before the world record. What's really old? What's really old? Okay, close, not there. 
because what everything that's beneath that thing in the middle is is old. That's perfectly right. What else? Come on, what is the thing in the middle? Nothing new under the sun. There we go. Who who does that drawer? Drawer <laughs> wins it, right? There's nothing new under the sun. And so what I am going to try to, to help you understand today is that this lean, agile approach to building startups is not new. It's something that is very basic, first principles, right? Fundamentals that, that we've all used in our lives before. And to bring that to life, I want to introduce you to a term that maybe some of you have heard or maybe some of you haven't. Ready? Kaizen. Kaizen. Right? And now, how many people know what Kaizen is? Anybody want to take a stab at the definition of Kaizen? Come on. Somebody. All right. Means, Kaizen, Kaizen is a ahead, philosophy. Sorry. Kaizen is a philosophy that means you should always be trying to improve yourself, like always improving. Okay, good, Nevin. That, that's a good answer. But like you're CMU students and you work really hard in your other classes. So I put the answer right on the page. Come on. Rapid, continuous incremental improvement you got that nevin you were right improvement right it's rapid continuous incremental improvement right cycling through again and again right and does anybody know where this concept of kaizen was developed kaizen is a japanese uh philosophy and also a word okay we, we we've heard it's a japanese philosophy anybody else Isn't it also from GE, like they adopted the idea? Uh, that's good. Good thought. Is that Nevin again that said that? Uh, yeah. Okay, good. You don't have your picture on, so I can't see you talking. So, good. Okay, we have Japan. We have GE. Thanks, Nevin. Any other guesses? It was introduced by Toyota, right? Back in the while ago. Frederick Taylor, Time and Motion Studies. Is that what you're thinking of? Don't remember. That doesn't ring a bell, but. That it was That's kind I mean. of like what he was saying about GE or yeah. um, originated with like car making process with Toyota. Yeah, if it goes if it goes to, to to Taylor, then it goes to Drucker, and then I heard Toyota. All right, so all of that is in the ballpark, but not not exactly correct. Okay, so so it it, it, it World War II, unfortunately, um, we we uh, to end the war. Whoops, jumped too far ahead there. To end the war, um, there were atomic bombs that were dropped on. Uh, Japan and there was firebombing of Tokyo and unfortunately uh, you know that that led to destruction of their industrial base um, and and you know really bad things but their silver lining on that cloud was there was ability to rebuild things from the ground up take a clean sheet of paper and say okay how are we going to approach uh, bringing uh, manufacturing to the level that we would like to bring it uh, and so the, this concept of quality came into to play and it was actually a a unit of the united states government under the marshall plan i think you probably heard of the marshall plan uh, it was on a, a plan to rebuild europe and there was a similar plan to help rebuild the, the japanese economy and and um they they developed a training film uh called improvement in four steps which you know i can't speak japanese but kaizen onyo yondankai right? Kaizen, meaning improvement, is where it came from. And it was actually developed by a famous uh, American uh, who, who now, this person's name is on the quality award that's given worldwide through the ISO, uh, the International Standards Organization, you've heard of ISO 9000, and that was Edwards Deming, right? So if you've heard of the Deming Award for quality, it was because of this clean approach to to manufacturing modularizing and 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 incrementally improving and the first large scale implementation of this with a japanese company called toyota tps the toyota production system so that's that that part of it was correct that uh, that Keyshawn had said and then it started to grow um, throughout the, the 50s and 60s 
to uh, across the world and companies like General Electric, uh, GE adopted it. And then they had their, their black belt system of, of uh, uh, you know, sort of layering that concept on top of the uh, uh, Kaizen principles. And we started to call the, this lean manufacturing and agile manufacturing. And so in the eighties and nineties, um, software developers started to take uh, notice of these quality processes that were working so well um, in manufacturing and started to adopt it in the way that they developed software. And this led to uh, a famous document in technology called the Agile Manifesto. I, I wouldn't uh, recommend anybody reading it because it is thick and very boring, <laughs> but it did have some really great concepts that came out of it. And those four concepts are right there in the middle, is that we're going to value in individuals and in interaction over processes and tools, right? individuals matter. We want to know what people think. We want to have interactions with them so that we can incrementally learn. We want to build working software over comprehensive documentation. We want to have customer collaboration rather than worrying about the nuts and bolts of a contract. And we want to respond to change rather than following a plan that was old and stale and out of date the moment that we finish that plan. So we want to be able to, to be rapid and incremental in improving ourselves, right? And, and the, the, the two folks that were most famous in putting the Agile Manifesto together were Sutherland and, and Schwaber. And uh, uh, Schwaber is actually uh, known as the father of Scrum, uh, which was a, a, a approach to, to managing uh, the, the software development and the technology development process um, that was really popularized at Google in the early 2000s. So uh, as it turned out, um, in, in the early 2000s, the software world started to take uh, notice of that. Uh, and so, so they started to think about how they could apply these same lean and agile concepts to the development of a, a, a startup. And that's where we got a new terminology that we'll talk about here. So um, it's really important to sort of understand, you know, why, why we talk about this. It's because most startup fail. Right. It turns out that uh, the, the failure rate for startups is incredibly high. Does anybody have a guess at how, you know, what the failure rate for startups is out there? 80%. 80%. 90%. Anybody else? 99.5%. Yeah. If you, what, if, what do you do? Go ahead. Go ahead, Spencer. Uh, sorry, I was going to just ask what you quantify as a success. If it's like raising a million dollars or getting profitability or. You know. the, the, the latter, getting to profitability, being long-term sustainable. Okay. Uh, 98%. Yeah. So it, it turns out it's, it's, it's greater than 99% if you start with just ideas that people spend some significant amount of time on, right? It may never have actually become a company, right? We haven't, we didn't incorporate it, but it fails. And, and that number is incredibly high. And the whole, the whole process that we talk about here today is to help bring that failure rate down, right? To improve the probability of success. Um, you know, and, and you know, it, the, it, it's so stark what the failure rates are. In, and I saw this about five years ago, the National Venture Capital Association did a study and came out and said that 70 uh, 71 percent of all startups that did raise institutional venture capital uh, did not return that capital right now that means they either outright failed or they were what we call the walking dead they continue to move on you know they, they might be able to stay alive but they're not wildly profitable and and the investors can't get their money back out so even historically even the companies that go and raise money from the vcs the smartest people in the world the professionals that are evaluating these you know 71 percent fail to return capital so so you know we've got to try to do better than that and so that leads us to this question why do most startups fail and does anybody know the the answer to that question it's 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 actually timing. simple no it's not timing but it's a good good thought spencer they misidentified the market they misidentified the market and so why did they misidentify the market 
because they didn't talk to the customers. Exactly. They didn't get out and talk to customers early and often enough, right? So in our new venture creation class, uh, we had our teams put together their ideas um, and they pitched them today. But the next step is, is we are going to, you know, very strategically using the business model canvas, figure out which customer segment we're going to start with, right? Because everything starts with making sure we're talking to the right customer who has a real problem that they're willing to pay to solve today, right? And so since we're talking about this, this whole sort of rapid incremental continuous improvement thought, uh, the, the startup world came up with, with a, a new term, uh, another evolution called the MVP. MVP, right? Now, does anybody know what MVP stands for? Blurt out. Minimal viable product. Minimum viable product. No, it stands for most valuable player. MVP, most valuable player. Come on. Like you just can't steal a name and like apply it where you want to. That's not true. That drawer, that's that's a violation of ethics. I want to speak to somebody about that. <laughs> Who are we gonna talk to, right? No. Right? Uh, we we are ethics MVP, so you may have to. <laughs> there you go. I want you to change your name to ethics M A P, right? And it, you're, you'll hear from Sean Amirati who, who gives a, a, a talk about agile product development. And uh, it, he talks about, it's not MVP, it's minimally awesome product because if it's just viable, are people gonna like it, right? By the way, Miguel, if you're out there, I put this, this one up there for you, right? Miguel is a Portuguese fan and that's Ronaldo, the greatest <laughs> soccer player of all time, huh? So, so we want you to think about this as, I'm not going to make something that's minimally crappy. I want to make it as good as it possibly can be. So we talk about, you know, the low fidelity prototypes to high fidelity prototypes. And, and the low fidelity prototypes still have to be awesome at what they are. They're, they might not have a huge amount of detail. By the way, you might be thinking, what's a low fidelity prototype? It could be a storyboard. It could be a block model that you put together that represents what a product can become, right? So, but even at that level, it has to be as good as it can be so that it conveys the idea. So this concept of, of, of talking to customers and getting early prototypes in front of people is where customer development and product development come together. And customer development is just as important as product development. And in the i program and in our new venture creation class, we're gonna focus, if, if you look at the customer development part, the customer discovery and validation phase is important because that's where the failure happens, right? We don't understand what our customer's problem is. We haven't validated that they're searching for a solution to that problem and they'd be willing to pay for it today, right? And so this is where the term, um, you know, uh, minimum viable product came from. Uh, Steve Blank, who is the author of the i program, Eric Reese, um, who wrote the book, The Lean Startup, and a professor of entrepreneurship at, at Harvard uh, University named Tom Eisenman. And uh, Tom's written a lot of scholarly papers on this process as well uh, to help validate what we've learned in practice and empirically about this sort of rapid continuous uh, improvement cycle uh, that we use in startups. So um, here, here's the challenge for us at, at the early stage is that we only have hypotheses, right? We don't have facts. We think that our customer uh, has this problem, uh, but we're not sure. So we have to go out into the world and validate it. But even when we validated that they have this problem, we still have to validate whether or not our solution is actually the right, right solution for that problem, right? So we have an unknown problem and an unknown solution. And, and that's where you know, the customer development sort of meets this agile product development that we've been talking about, rapid incremental, low fidelity, moving our way up to you know, high fidelity prototypes, you know, not doing a minimum viable product, but doing a minimally awesome product as we go through there, okay? So that's where these terms come from. And that's why we're going about it because we don't have the facts at the beginning. We only have hypotheses and we're validating those hypotheses. So that brings me back to our riddle. 
There's nothing new under the sun. And so what this process that we described, lean startups, agile product development, right? It, it, it's not new. It's been around for centuries. And each and every one of you learned about it, most likely in middle school. What is it? What is this approach? What is Kaizen, really? What is the lean startup approach, really? Any guesses? Think about it. You learned about it in middle school. What did you learn in middle school? What were the, what were the seminal things that you learned in middle school that it stayed with you for your entire life? If you don't succeed, like try, try again. Oh, oh that's, that's true. And entrepreneurs have to do that. My favorite quote is insane perseverance in the face of constant rejection, right? Come on. I know you guys know this. All it is, is the scientific method applied to business. That's all this is, right? We start with a hypothesis. We design the experiment to try to validate the hypothesis. We observe the data and synthesize the data that came out of that. And then we decide, are we going in the right direction or do we have to modify our hypotheses, right? That's all it is. Y'all learned it in middle school. And in fact, when I was a student at Carnegie Mellon, uh, you know, 3,000 years ago or 30 years ago, I can't tell the difference, exactly what I learned, right? Um, the words were different, right? The tools were slightly different. Obviously, we have much better tools today because of the ubiquity of information and computing power, et cetera. But it was still the same. And I learned it from that old fart who is actually still here at Carnegie Mellon. What the heck happened? It just, uh, sorry about that. My uh, PowerPoint blew. Can, let me uh, hang here for a second. Are we sharing screen anymore? Um, can you guys see my screen or are we back to the, the, the building blocks? Okay, I gotta stop sharing the screen here. Sorry about that. Um, what I'm gonna do right now is actually uh, transition to, to, to showing you the thing from Eric Reese, but um, I wanted to show you there that, that Frank Demler picture and, and Frank does a, a seminar for us, so it's called Splitting the Equity Pie. And I think that's next week, if I'm not mistaken, Allison. And yeah. uh, uh, it, it's great. I call, I call uh, uh, Frank the Yoda, I can't see it there, the Yoda of, of entrepreneurship here at Carnegie Mellon. Like he is the Jedi master. He, you know, he's been around forever. He's as old as dirt. And, uh, but he's really, really uh, smart and, and gives great advice. Um, bit gruff around the edges, right? But but still gives really great advice. And so so I I learned it from Frank, and and I applied it in in my five companies, and and you know some of the companies did really really well, some of them did just okay. That's all right though. That's that's part of the learning process. That's part of the the success. I think it's the journey rather than the dest destination that that ultimately matters. So what I'd like to do right now is actually share my screen again and, and I'll let you hear these words from, from Eric Reese. Um, and uh, Eric is, is a really smart guy. Uh, his, his newest startup is he's trying to create a stock exchange for long-term uh, 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 value and vision. And in fact, uh, one of our, uh, the, the people that's really involved in CMUT and E and did a diversity panel for us uh, a, a couple weeks back uh, is, is on that team. So if you want to learn more about that, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, not, you know, the current stock market today is, is a short term exchange of value. They have a, a long term focused uh, stock exchange. But um, this, this uh, video is, is from roughly uh, eight, uh, 10 years ago, actually, 10 years ago. And uh, uh, it's, it's really uh, excellent. Uh, and it gets into a little bit more depth around some of the the aspects of how to approach the lean startup. Like uh, to start today, I'm Eric Reese, by the way, I write the blog Startup Lessons Learned, which hopefully we'll show on here. Uh, the hashtag is lean startup, if you would, thank you. I would like to ask all of us a simple thing, which is to stop wasting people's time. And here's what I mean. We all know that startups fail. We're accustomed to that. Uh, I thought I'd brought up, bring a demonstration. This is web 2.0 circa 2006 when our enthusiasm was at its peak a graphic designer put together this 
patchwork quilt of logos. And then I also brought what I consider to be our midterm report card. It looks like this. This is Web 2.0 circa 2009. You can already see the blood red X's of all the companies that are no longer with us. And yet the designer also made an interesting choice to mark with green circles the supposed successes of Web 2.0. Those are the companies that have gone IPO or were acquired, which means they were acquired. And which is another way of saying those are the companies where somebody made money. And I'm all for people making money. But my question for today is, how many of these supposed successes succeeded in living up to the raw talent, passion, time, and energy that the founders and employees poured into them? And I think by that higher standard of success, we're not doing very well as an industry. And in case you think I'm just picking on startups, the same statistics hold true in new product introductions in the enterprise, in the supermarket, uh, it's true of corporate IT projects. And I don't think it's because we're taking too much risk. On the contrary, I think we're taking not enough risk because we are building products that fundamentally nobody wants. And that is a preventable condition. Now, uh, that is what, when I say stop wasting people's time, that's what I mean. We are building faith-based initiatives and that's not a good idea. We are taking untested, unvalidated assumptions, and we are pouring people's time and energy into them. Now, lest you think I'm being negative about entrepreneurship, you should know I think entrepreneurship is awesome. And that this thing we call software, internet, web 2.0, is changing the face of work in this world. Software is imagination made tangible, and because of that, it has nonlinear effects in every industry it infects. And that causes disruption, chaos, lowering of barriers, and stress for our friends who are in established businesses, but tremendous opportunity for entrepreneurs everywhere. And in the last year, as I have traveled the world talking about this thing called the Lean Startup, I have gotten to see that there are now more practicing entrepreneurs on this earth than have ever been in the history of the world. And those entrepreneurs are not necessarily going to make any money. Let's be honest. Entrepreneurship is not a good way to make money. I'm sorry if there's some of you for whom that's bad news. But entrepreneurship is a noble calling. It combines uniquely among careers three simultaneous things. The ability to change the world for the better, the ability to create lasting value, and also make customers' lives better, all at the same time. And yet, it is these very entrepreneurs who are wasting people's time building something that nobody wants. And I think in order to stop that from happening, we have to put the practice of entrepreneurship on a more rigorous footing. And the first step is to begin with a definition. So here's mine. A startup is a human institution designed to create something new under conditions of extreme uncertainty. Notice I didn't say anything about what industry you're in or what sector of the economy or even the size of company you work at. In my travels, I have gotten to meet many very talented, involuntary entrepreneurs who tried to take a safe job at a safe company in a safe industry, but then discovered there's no such thing in this world. So anyone who's trying to create disruptive innovation under conditions of uncertainty is an entrepreneur. That's not a metaphor. And that's just a fancy way of saying a startup is an experiment. An experiment not just in can we build a product, but should we build it? And more importantly, can we build an organization, a sustainable organization, to support that series of products and services? And the funny thing about that definition is it means that entrepreneurship is management. Huh? Because when we think of management, we, most of us have a very 20th century view of what that looks like. We think of general management as was practiced in the 20th century, the general management that powers the supply chains that, let's face it, keep us all alive. But I believe we need a new management science, entrepreneurial management, not better or worse than general management, but different, geared specifically to the principles of extreme uncertainty that is the soil in which all entrepreneurs live. And the first uh, of those management principles I want to talk about is this thing called the pivot. Um, the pivot is a word that's gone a little bit mainstream this year. It's entered the zeitgeist. I knew when I saw this in the New Yorker, I don't know if you can read this. It says, I'm not leaving you. I'm pivoting to a new man. <laughs> so sorry about that. But that cartoon actually has a certain wisdom to it because what entrepreneurs do when they have a vision and encounter difficulty is they don't just give up on the vision, but they don't just persevere the plane right into the ground either. They keep one foot firmly rooted in what they've learned so far while systematically changing one other thing at a time. 
And that's why successful entrepreneurs do not have better ideas than unsuccessful entrepreneurs. They have superior process. And they have this kind of zigzaggy path from initial idea to eventual success, which only in retrospect looks nice and linear, or unfortunately, when you read about it in the press. And the premise of the Lean Startup is actually very simple. If we can reduce the time between pivots, we can increase our odds of success before we run out of money. Because what matters in any entrepreneurial situation from the garage to the enterprise is not how much money do I have left, but how many pivots do I have left? So if we're gonna stop wasting people's time, we have to learn to pivot faster. And yet the fastest way to iterate is just to go around and around in a circle. That's not helpful either. We have to know, how do we know if we're making progress or just engaged in forward motion? And that is the enduring conundrum of entrepreneurship, knowing if I'm making progress. The Lean Startup takes its inspiration and its principles from lean manufacturing that confronted the same question. How do we tell the difference between value creating activities and waste? As I mentioned at the top, many startups are actually building something that nobody wants. And if you're building something that nobody wants, what does it matter if you're on budget and on time or on schedule? Why are we using milestones and schedules to manage something which fundamentally is uncertain and has, in many cases, a fatal problem at the root? Instead, we need a new definition of progress, what I call validated learning. And I'll share with you how I came to that conclusion. This is how I was taught to do product development as a software engineer in Silicon Valley. It's called the waterfall methodology. Um, I'm sure many of you have uh, tried this. I was taught this as the, uh, as the manufacturing metaphor for software development. And you can imagine how pissed I was when I found out that they don't even use it for manufacturing anymore. So what's our excuse for doing it in software development? It's ridiculous. Uh, and the waterfall methodology is easy to pick on because we've had quite a lot of time to study it. But it's important to remember that the waterfall methodology does work when you're in a situation of the known problem, known solution. That is when you're making something that is very similar to something you have made in the past, you can have this linear sense of progress through a pre-existing plan. That's why the unit of progress of waterfall is advancing to the next stage. As long as we're doing what we said we were going to do, we consider that success, even if what we said we were going to do was stupid. And that is what leads to this problem we call achieving failure. When you successfully execute the plan, but the plan takes you right off a cliff. Now, the last 10 years have been about this thing called agile product development. Uh, and I've shown here, this is extreme programming, which is my personal favorite of the Agile methodologies. And Agile has the uh, important insight that if we change our unit of progress to a line of working code, we can stop achieving failure. And this point of view works when the problem is known, it's the solution that is unknown, which is often the case in corporate IT projects where Agile has had its biggest impact. So if we create specification documents that nobody reads, or documentation that goes stale, or create software with bugs that then have to be reworked, all that constitutes waste, and Agile uh, is a way of eliminating that waste. Unfortunately, startups don't live in this world either. They live in this world. The unknown problem and unknown solution. If we're gonna sit a customer, an in-house customer with the engineers, what if we don't know who the customer is yet? What if we don't know what problem we're trying to solve yet? Uh, there's a lot on this diagram I can't go into today. You can learn more on my blog. I just want to focus in on this idea of the unit of progress called validated learning. And I'll just tell you a story. Uh, I founded a company called IMVU, and the very first version of that product took us six months to build. And I was the CTO of the company. It was my job to be responsible for the technical architecture. And I don't want to mince words. The first version of this product sucked. Okay, it was every bit as likely to crash your computer as it was to give you your delightful consumer 3D avatar experience. And I was personally embarrassed to ship it. I was like, oh God, people are going to use it and think, you know, we don't know what quality software is. I had this image of a journalist writing this article, you know, idiots launch software, don't know about quality. But turned out I needn't to have worried. Some of you already know the punchline because you've done this too, because of course nobody used the software. <laughs> we couldn't even get people to download it. So they couldn't even discover how buggy it was. And it was my co-founders who had to drag me kicking and screaming to the realization that we'd actually built the wrong product. We had once again built something that nobody wanted. And let's face it, I was depressed because I was the guy who had written, I don't know, 40,000 lines of code to build that initial prototype, almost all of which had to get thrown out. The good code and the bad code alike. Failure is a great equalizer of quality. And then I said, wait, are you telling me I would have contributed just as much value to this company if I had spent the last six months on a beach, on vacation, 
as I did killing myself to get this prototype out, I said, no, 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 that's not true. Because if we hadn't written all this code, we wouldn't have learned this important thing about customers. So then I felt better. And then I had this dark thought that plagued me, which was, but if my goal of the last six months was to learn this important thing about customers, did I really need 40,000 lines of code to do it? Is there no way I could have had the same learning with 20,000 lines of code or 10,000? And then I was like, wait, what if I had just asked some customers if they would like to download this product? After all, 0% of them did. Would I have learned the same amount in one week as I did in six months? And that led me to this. This is the kind of the flux capacitor of the lean startup, if you will. This is the fundamental feedback loop that powers all startups, the build, measure, learn feedback loop. We take vision, we turn it into action. Through that action, we reveal the truth about our vision and we iterate. And from this diagram, I can give you a heuristic for evaluating any process or managerial or architecture change in a startup situation, which is, does it minimize the total time through this feedback loop, or does it sub-optimize by helping us do only our narrow job function well? Most of the management practices that kill startups violate that simple rule. And with this diagram, I can now put the concept of the pivot on a more rigorous footing, because I can say a pivot is one full turn through this feedback loop. Now, there's a lot more to the Lean Startup. Uh, it looks like this. These are all the specific tactics and techniques that we teach. You can learn about this online if you're interested. What all of these techniques have in common is my belief that they operate at one specific stage of the feedback loop, but they have the effect of minimizing total time to the feedback loop. In other words, they help us stop wasting people's time. And before I close, I want to share one last thing. Um, this is actually a full circle moment for me. I first talked about the Lean Startup in public one year ago at the Web 2.0 Expo right here in San Francisco. And since that time, what began as a movement of high-tech entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley to increase our odds of success has really blossomed into something much bigger, a movement that I believe is dedicated to stop wasting people's time. Uh, you may be familiar with this. This is the Gartner hype cycle. Uh, the Lean Startup has reached almost the top of the peak of inflated expectations, and I am sad to say that I think we're coming on the trough of disillusionment pretty soon. Uh, so I apologize for the hype. That's not my goal. And because of the hype, there have been some misunderstandings about the Lean Startup that have become somewhat prevalent. I actually believe being misunderstood is a big step up from being ignored. So thank you. And I want to address those misunderstandings because each of them reveals a deeper truth about what we're trying to do with this movement. And so I thought I'd just talk about them briefly. The first is that lean means cheap. Uh, and people who feel this way really don't understand that lean has a specific word, a specific meaning in a business context. Lean is about speed, speed through that fundamental feedback loop, not bodies in motion, but validated learning about customers. Lean startups actually accelerate as they scale instead of grinding to that bureaucratic halt we're more familiar with. The second myth is that Lean Startup is just for Web 2.0 internet consumer software companies. That's my background, so that's an understandable uh, uh, understanding, but there are quite a few other theorists, uh, Steve Blank, Dave McClure, Sean Ellis, who come from different backgrounds who have been part of this movement. And I think we're starting to get the word out. As I said at the top, any business that faces uncertainty about what customers will want can benefit from these techniques. The third myth is that uh, lean startups are somehow small bootstrap startups. They, they either they lack ambition or they take pride in being cheap. But our goal, remember, is to create a human institution that can grow, that can change the world, that can have an impact. And in fact, as our friends in the venture community are starting to learn, when we actually understand what customers actually want instead of just what we hope or think they want, we actually have the ability to deploy large amounts of capital more effectively than in traditional models. And last, this is the most pernicious, that somehow by incorporating data or feedback into our entrepreneurial process, we seek to replace vision with data. And as I said right at the beginning, entrepreneurship fundamentally is about vision, about a vision of the world as it might be. And what I think is odd is that if we really believe those visions, if we really believe the world needs to change in an urgent way, then I don't understand how we can afford to be engaged in a faith-based initiative. I don't understand that. If we have assumptions that are essential to the success of that vision, we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to the world to test them against reality, to see what actually is possible, and, of course, to stop wasting people's time. So here's how to get in touch. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Sorry, just uh, 
getting rid of that. So thank you for uh, uh, looking through that. We're, we're, we're real short on time. Uh, so thought I have a couple of, of, of um, thoughts for you to, to, to think about before we leave here today. Let me uh, adjust my screen here. Um, and then I, I will stay past 1.30 for anybody that wants to ask questions. Uh, at, but uh, I know some of you probably have to leave uh, at that time frame. Okay, here we go. Um, so there, there are three failure modes that, that um, entrepreneurs come across in these early stages. And, and we're, we're talking about the zero to one, zero being idea, one being that product market fit. And the first of those is the false positive. And the false positive comes about on when we're talking, you know, we don't talk to enough customers and we're getting poor signal. Uh, the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, relevant example of that is what we call a convenient sample. You know, your college students, the, the you know your friends on the floor, or the, the members of your sorority or your fraternity, right? And they give you uh, what they think you want to hear, and and they don't give you the truth. So we need to talk to as many diverse, random folks as we possibly can to make sure that we're eliminating false positives. But that also leads to the signal to the noise problem for you for you electrical engineers out there, right? Is that you know if we talk to so many people, we get conflicting uh, uh, answers back. Well, that typically is because we have introduced some sort of bias into the situation, and it might be that part of our sample is completely random, and part of our sample is part of our, our convenience sample, you know, our friends and family who, who tell us something that's different. So you have to work very, very hard to make sure that you take bias out of the situation. And, and there's a lot of customer discovery tools, a lot of design thinking tools that are out there that can help you do that. Uh, and, and the third failure mode is that, you know, your product is just not good enough, right? And, and that's really, really important. So as we go through the prototyping, process and we you know where we apply the principles of minimally awesome product we have to think about it in terms of the goodness factor and some of you have heard about this before and some of you haven't it was uh, actually coined by a, a cmu uh, professor and robot entrepreneur named don jones uh, he was actually my co-founder for my first company and i have religiously applied this concept of goodness factor o over the last 30 years and, and basically you know don posited that you know for any new startup to to make it it has to be three times better or three times cheaper than the solutions that are out there and the reason for that is because people form habits and they don't want to change right uh, you know people I joke are lazy right but they're lazy in a good way they, they, they create habits and, and they you know to get them to change that habit uh, you know, it, it, it takes something that's compellingly better or compellingly cheaper. And, and I, I know my class has heard this, this uh, idea or this, this example before, but I always, um, you know, ask the, an audience, like, how many of you, uh, you know, uh, it, it, and it's true, Bing as a search engine is provably better than Google search engine on a number of different dimensions. Provably better. There's been research papers written about it. But how many of you use Bing, right? Anybody? Just shout out, yeah, I use Bing. Not one person out of 60, right? If I get one, it's usually I say, oh, you worked for Microsoft, didn't you? <laughs> and, uh, and that's right. And the reason is, is Bing is only incrementally you know, better than Google on the dimensions that it's better. It's not compellingly better, right? So I, I, I you know, thought, for a long time that it was you know three times better three times cheaper as a as a good uh you know metric and and i you know i read a couple of books about four or five years ago zero to one from peter Thiel, founder of paypal um investor in facebook and then uh, the hard thing about hard things from ben horowitz the one half of the andreessen horowitz uh, uh venture capital company and and you know they say in today's world it's 10 times right because we have so many more solutions available to us you can't just be three times better or you have to be 10 times better i, I don't focus on the number three or ten the, the it's compellingly better those numbers are just representative of it you know it has to be compellingly better or compellingly cheaper 
right? And then because you are a new startup that nobody's met before, you have to be very careful how you communicate, right? You have to break the benefits down into things that people understand. Complex benefits will confuse people. You have to save time, you have to save or make money, or you have to create new connections for folks, right? Because otherwise, um, they, they just won't understand, you know, if you say, oh, our, our, our product makes you happier. Well, happy means something different to everybody, but time and money and a new connection, those are important to everybody. Uh, we use tools like the Business Model Canvas. Um, uh, uh, they're very, very good at keeping your team on the same page. But for those of you starting out on your I you know, NSF i journey or in new venture creation, we can't serve all of our customers. The, the first building block is called customer segment because we have to segment our customers to those early adopters, those people that with our minimally awesome product, our low fidelity prototype, we can still deliver value to them. So think about that. You can't serve all of your potential customers. So you have to narrow it down to the customers you can serve first. I heard from the ethics MVP people today that their, their you know, customer segment is incubators and accelerators, right? That's, that's a starting place. They have a whole bunch of customers that they think they can serve over the long term, but they're gonna start with incubators and accelerators who all have a common set of issues and problems, right? So you need to think about what narrow customer segment can you serve first, okay? So uh, that's, that's it for today.